What do you want from me? What is this about? Welcome back everyone, this is going to be my Loki episode 2 video. There were so many Marvel Easter eggs, it is ladies night on Loki. If you're new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes, be sure to subscribe to get all of them. We're doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships, all you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just leave your favorite Easter egg from the episode on the video. Careful for spoilers for everything that's happened on Loki so far if you haven't seen the episodes. So we'll just start at the beginning of the episode and work our way through shot by shot talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments, foreshadowing, and I'll just number these as we go along to stay organized. Starting with the title of the episode, The Variant, which is obviously a reference to both of these Lokis, the Loki 1130, our main version of Loki now, and the other new main variant Loki, the antagonist, Lady Loki, that they're chasing after. This time there's no cold open, they just do the previously on and it goes straight to that new green Loki themed Marvel Studios logo, and then they start at the Renaissance Fair in Oshkosh, Wisconsin in 1985. There were a couple of really notable things that happened at Marvel during 1985. It was the year the character Apocalypse debuted, Nebula, Legion, and the Flag Smasher character, which we just saw on Falcon and Winter Soldier, or a version of Flag Smasher. They also used this intro scene to introduce one of the new main TVA hunters, C-20, played by Sasha Lane. She shows up in the trailer footage from later episodes, so it seems like she's going to continue to be a big character in the series. But she's like another version of B-15, just like another one of these bigger hunters. They take the bait, head into the tent, and female Loki gets the drop on them. The automatic PA system starts up as if it normally would, like a new group of cosplayers stepped in to participate in this big battle event that's supposed to take place in the tent. They play with a lot of metaphors here, like this is a battle of good versus evil, and the prize is the princess, which is a reference to Lady Loki because regular male Loki is a prince of Asgard, so female version of Loki would be a princess of Asgard, just like Hela. Then Lady Loki casts an enchantment on Hunter C-20 so that she starts taking out all the other TVA Minutemen. They use the PA voice system to set up that holding out for a hero song. They're just using it as a joke reference to what Lady Loki has just done, turning Hunter C-20 into the hero. Like they want you to think that she's the antagonist when really, like later by the end of the episode, the way they're portraying the timekeepers and all the sinister things that are going on in the TVA is if they're the real villains, she escapes taking Hunter C-20 with her and their wrist technology, allowing her to open her own portals. Obviously she then needs that to activate all the time device bombs that she uses later in the episode. But then we jump back to the TVA with our new Loki at Mobius's desk reading his jet ski magazine. The funny thing here is the model looks suspiciously like a much younger version of Chris Hemsworth just with really short hair. Mobius does explain the jet ski metaphor later in the episode too, like why he's so obsessed with jet skis. They have this big joke with Miss Minutes on Loki's desk. There's this hologram that's quizzing him on the rules of the TVA trying to teach him how everything is supposed to work. He kind of pays attention, like he answers all the questions correctly, but then tries to swat her away like, are you real? Are you actually listening to me? And she does answer, uh, kind of both, so she is kind of like a living version of Jarvis, like a really hypertech version of Jarvis. It seems like her systems are so advanced and complex, I feel like there's also a big twist coming with her character too, with Miss Minutes, in addition to the big twist with the timekeepers that we're all expecting. They also use a lot of these introduction scenes early in the episode, especially when they go out on the mission with this version of Loki to re-explain a lot of the complicated ideas from the episode, like how do branch timelines work, how do Nexus events work. The way they explain it once you go past a red line, the new branch timeline that's created starts to function like a completely alternate reality and the TVA can no longer use the time reset devices to undo any of the harmful changes. Miss Minutes keeps hyping up how that would lead to the destruction of the sacred timeline and the collapse of all reality as they know it, which kind of foreshadows the big twist at the end of the episode with all the time bombs that go off at all the different places in time. But the way they've hyped this up, the big sinister overtones that you get from the timekeepers, it doesn't sound like that's the complete truth. Like it's just more of the dogma that the timekeepers are forcing on the TVA workers. Like they want you to think like it's going to be the end of all reality. Like a lot of people are now wondering if Lady Loki created the multiverse at the end of the episode. I think it's going to be a little more complicated than that, but we'll get to that in a second. Don't worry. There's just so much stuff that happened during this episode that we have to talk about. But you notice after he does try to swat Miss Minutes hologram, she tries to avoid him, then jumps back into the monitor. And even though he passed her test, she fails him and she's like frowning at him as he's walking away with Mobius. 
He gets an official TVA jacket, identifying him as a variant they kind of used to make fun of him a little bit. And then as they're explaining the case, they show you a bunch of alternate versions of Loki. So like there's one here with a slightly different version of his original costume from the first Thor movie, just made to look a little more old timey, but he's blue because that is his natural skin color. He is a frost giant. The only reason why his skin looks like this is because he uses his magic to make himself look like other Asgardians. They do give you special number designations for all these different Lokis. Not all of them I think are meant to be specific comic book references, but then there's another Loki that looks like he cheated to win the Tour de France, go team Loki because of his bike shorts here, like he used his natural extra strength and endurance that he has as a frost giant to beat everyone. There's a version of Loki that seems like he's half Minotaur, like a Tauren version of Loki. It seems like some of these other Lokis are also based on classical depictions of Norse mythological Loki. Like there's kind of a satyr looking version of Loki than a more classic Norse looking version of Loki. When he says that sometimes some of these variants powers are different but they share some common powers, that's just a reference to all of the classical real world depictions of the mythological Loki. Then they have the argument about the difference between creating duplicates and illusions just as a way for Loki to nerd out like he goes full Professor Loki like how dare you it's much more difficult to create duplicates. They start to set up the jokes about Lady Loki being the superior version of Loki just to make him feel smaller. This is all obviously setting up a big twist for his arc during the series. Mobius makes a joke about this later too when he says the real reason why I picked you is because I knew you would pursue this and try to solve the case in order to prove yourself superior because your ego is so big. They also set up this whole idea of Loki versus the timekeepers. Like Mobius jokes they're not worried about him betraying them getting his magic powers back because how would that get you closer to getting yourself in front of the timekeepers? And even though later in the episode Loki sort of comes clean about his true plan like he hopes to eventually take out the timekeepers and replace them, I think that's also a misdirect and there'll be a big twist when they do the big Wizard of Oz reveal who's really behind the curtain, what's really going on with the timekeepers, and it's not what anyone is expecting, it's not what Loki is expecting, and it's not what fans are expecting either. They portal in and then they do another big exposition dump explaining how time travel works. Like how come we don't just travel to before this whole attack happened? They have to arrive in the moment when the Nexus event is being created otherwise they'll miss it. Iron Man had a conversation about this during Avengers Endgame when he tried to explain how complex and how hard it was to time travel correctly. The way the producers talk about the rules of time travel on the Loki series is that they actually had to evolve, they had to change the rules that they created during Avengers Endgame because the rules that they set up in Avengers Endgame had too many plot holes in it. So if it seems like the rules are different now on the Loki series, those are actually the real new rules, the canonical rules of time travel in the MCU. Loki also makes more jokes about TVA propaganda too, like I watched some of your videos, those propaganda videos. It's a term you typically use when you speak of something sinister, like propaganda is bad. This is all just foreshadowing the big TVA, big timekeepers reveal. I don't think that's going to happen for a couple episodes, so don't be surprised if you see more easter eggs like this in the background, just foreshadowing for timekeepers being the bad characters here. He also makes a joke about the time reset devices kind of disintegrating everything. A lot of what happens here in the tent with them investigating this crime scene is a big misdirect though with Loki just trying to speechify his way into a faster audience with the timekeepers. Mobius calls him out on it and then they take off after resetting this area. His big speech about wolf's ears and wolf's teeth, that is from actual Norse mythology though. Where there are wolf's ears, wolf's teeth are near. Then just as they get done talking about the timekeepers themselves, they transition to the face of the timekeeper statue. It's the middle timekeeper, the one that kind of looks like the Jonathan Majors looking Kang the Conqueror character, but it is a much better depiction of it in 3D. Like you actually see the reptilian looking features, like Loki calls them space lizards because they are reptilian in the comics. A lot of people were just thinking after episode one and that whole big Secret Wars teaser about the backstory of the TVA that they kind of changed this middle timekeeper a little bit in the MCU explainer for the timekeepers might be a little bit different as well to help foreshadow a version of Kang the Conqueror in the MCU. Like MCU Kang will be a little bit different from comic book Kang. There were literally a couple of Kang easter eggs that happened right after this moment too in this scene. But Mobius talks about the other artifacts that Ravonna Renslayer in her office here has collected from a lot of their big missions. You see them from all different eras in history but you also notice that her old helmet and her old baton are sitting there too. 
They haven't really gotten into her backstory yet, but they'll get into that in future episodes. She used to be a hunter and then just worked her way up and got promoted to a judge. But she takes him to task on Loki's insubordination, but then claims Mobius himself is kind of insubordinate all the time. And then he throws it right back in her face saying that she used to be just like that too, which I think is just foreshadowing her eventually helping them uncover larger shady stuff going on inside the TVA with the timekeepers. Like eventually she will be an ally to them, even though during the episode, the other TVA hunters seem like they hate Loki and want to blame him for all the stuff that goes wrong during their missions. He also pronounces her name a little bit different than I expected too. He says it Ravona, so you could say it Ravona, Ravana, either way you want. There's also a funny WandaVision callback too, when she calls him out for not using a coaster, and the coaster is a hexagon shape. So everybody post your hexagon jokes. Jimmy Woo's going crazy about this one. Mobius also questions the nature of the timekeepers, like, hey, those timekeepers, how they doing? And Ravona doesn't really say much about him. She kind of blows past it. Like, she gets all of her orders from them, from her monitor, as if she's never actually talked to them herself either. They get into this later in the episode with Mobius' character, too. Like, Loki is questioning everything. Like, this is all ridiculous. Who has free will? What is free will? Mobius says that he doesn't question anything, and it seems like Ravona is the same, too. Like, up to this point, she hasn't questioned any of the dogma or the propaganda the TVA has given her. But the big Kang the Conqueror Easter egg you probably spotted is when Mobius picks up her pen and it says Franklin D. Roosevelt High School and says it must be from the analyst that she's keeping on the side. The pen is blue, like the color of the Fantastic for you could point to the Franklin name and say it's a reference to Franklin Richards and just more association with Fantastic Four characters because Kang the Conqueror's real name is Nathaniel Richards. He's a distant descendant of Reed Richards from the far future. And in the comics, he was Ravana's longtime love interest. So it just seems like they're trying to set that up in the background in the MCU at this point. And Jonathan Majors was actually asked about this in an interview. People asked him if he was going to show up during the Loki series and he just deflected like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. But it sounds like they're trying to say that Kang started out as another analyst just like Mobius. You may have noticed some familiar Easter eggs as they're working their way down the elevator. Like obviously this architecture here looks really cool the way they do this scene. It looks really beautiful. And you have the timekeeper statues everywhere in the episode, including here. Like they show up everywhere in the episode. But this whole structure might look familiar because this is an actual hotel in Atlanta that they go film at. It shows up in a ton of different movies just because it looks so unique and so cool. It probably seems familiar too because it was also in this vulture scene from Spider-Man Homecoming. As they step into the library here, you see the T-372. That's a reference to Thor issue number 372, the very first issue where the Time Variance Authority debuted in the comics. The files that he starts out reading here are similar events from the previous Thor movies, like the first Thor movie, then as part of his grander plan to uncover the darker mysteries of the TVA, the timekeepers, he asks for files on the creation of the TVA, sort of setting up that big twist. Then he asks for files on the beginning of time, the end of time, all classified. I, I was a big Wizard of Oz reveal, like there's going to be some big revelation by the end of the series. She says the only files that he's allowed to read are the files on himself, the previous 616 version of Loki that he sort of spun off of, and the variant Loki they're chasing, Lady Loki. You also notice in the background too on these different levels, they have the different designations here. Like you have LK3, then 2W1 underneath it. Those just correspond to the elevator buttons as the different levels of the Timekeeper Citadel. So the next file that he reads is basically the events of Thor Ragnarok, the destruction of Asgard. You see they designate it as a class 7 apocalypse. Later in the episode when they talk about the hurricane at the rocks cart, that's a class 10 apocalypse. It sounds like the lower the number, the bigger the apocalypse. Like class 1 apocalypse would be the worst kind. But you notice a bunch of Easter eggs on the page here. Like it says zero variance energy, which means that it was supposed to happen. It's part of the sacred timeline as the timekeepers designated, meaning that it was destined to happen, which is also something from real world Norse mythology. Like Ragnarok is always supposed to happen. It's all about the cycle of death and rebirth in mythology. Thor and Surtur kind of talk about this during their early conversation at the beginning of Thor Ragnarok as well. This big prophecy of Ragnarok. Lower on the page here, there's a reference to Thor's Revengers. Then he sort of gets the idea about Lady Loki hiding inside apocalyptic events. And as he rushes off the elevator to tell Morbius, you see more sinister propaganda posters on the wall here. And he completely trashes his salad trying to make a Thor Ragnarok metaphor. Like if I push the Hulk off the rainbow bridge here, just like shaking all the salt and the pepper and then grabbing the juice box from Casey. Poor Casey there. The other new Easter egg here too is that Boku juice box, which is another defunct brand, just like the Josta Soda, like a brand that's gone out of circulation. 
Just reminding you that the TVA is super powerful, they have time travel, they can get you anything that doesn't exist anymore because they can go to any place in the timeline. They have the joke about Loki stabbing everyone in the back 50 times. I wouldn't do it again because it's such a boring form of betrayal. So he gets them to take him to Pompeii to test their theory as the volcano's exploding. Like he says they can do anything they want as long as it's within certain limits because there's this bigger apocalypse that's going to happen. The timeline's going to be wiped anyway. So Loki does everything he can to violate the prime directive, so to speak, like reveal all their secrets. We're from the future. I know the volcano is going to explode. You're all going to die. Nothing matters. Loki's theory is proven correct. And later in the episode, they even suggest that Lady Loki has kept coming back to this rocks cart. Like this is the place in time that she's always coming back to because it seems like it's taken her a while to accumulate all these time reset devices she's set up in this warehouse. They have a bit of a bonding moment and then Mobius explains why he loves jet skis so much. When he says that all things eventually get ruined, I think that's more foreshadowing for the timekeepers and the TVA being the real villains and all this. Like things start out with a noble goal then slowly get perverted and ruined over time. Like a very dark knight type of statement. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain and the timekeepers are supposed to be immortal so they live forever. Also, I hope this is foreshadowing for them paying off this big jet ski twist and we actually see Mobius riding a jet ski by the end of the series. They have that big argument about the nature of the timekeepers and free will. So obviously more foreshadowing, timekeepers being really, really bad. Loki also has this really nice quote sort of framing everything in context saying no one bad is ever truly bad and no one good is ever truly good. Just more foreshadowing for Lady Loki not really being the villain, more the timekeepers being villains. They use the kablooey gum to track down Lady Loki. They also use that to set up that funny joke about there not being candy on Asgard apparently. Like he just laughs at him like, nuts, grapes? No wonder you're so bitter, you don't have candy. There's a joke about there being apocalypses all the time on Earth, like there's so many of them, there are hundreds of apocalypses every single year. I think that's just a commentary on real life. Like last year, 2020, felt like a very apocalyptic year. They happen all the time. So Rock's Cart, obviously a reference to Roxxon, which is an evil corporation. The funny thing about this too is when they portal in, they actually transition to the sign there of the hurricane sort of blowing it away. It actually looks kind of like a sinister picture. Like this whole town is meant to be a corporate town, but you look at it and you have this really evil corporation sort of sitting, casting this shadow on what seems like a very happy town. Like the town has a very happy sounding name, hiding the sinister nature of the corporation, which I think is another metaphor for the TVA itself. Like, very normal sounding name, hiding very villainous intent. If you're not really familiar with Roxxon, they're a natural resources company. They showed up during the Agent Carter series back in the 1940s. They're all over Marvel Comics and their CEO is actually Dario Agar, who is the Minotaur, a big Thor character that shows up in the Mighty Thor arc right after Jane Foster becomes Thor, which they're doing during Thor Love and Thunder pretty soon. Mobius also makes a reference to Loki being very clever and eventually taking his job. I think that's a reference to future seasons of the show. We know there's going to be a Loki season two and they'll continue on. But eventually I think the idea is that this Loki will redeem himself and be recognized as a full agent of the TVA like Mobius and the others, even if the TVA itself kind of changes a little in the big reveal of what's happening with the timekeepers. But as they portal in looking for Lady Loki, you see her watching them on the monitors. They split the teams up, sort of setting up this big twist. She sets the countdown clock for the bombs and we find her enchanting this man here, causing him to take advantage of these ultra low hurricane discounts on Azalea flowers. Like gotta get in on those discount prices. She uses her magic and then swap the enchantment. So she's not entering B-15's body or possessing her like this. She's just transferring the enchantment and knocking this person out so quickly that it seems like there was some body swapping going on. But Lady Loki is casting this magic from nearby in a different part of the store. Like she's using these different people as finger puppets basically. And because our Loki doesn't immediately detect it, they sort of play it more for that joke about who the real Loki is and who's the copy. Please, if anyone is anyone, you're another version of me. Just all the superior Loki jokes. Then as part of this whole arc of the TVA being the real villains here, over in Mobius's group, he has to stop one of his other TVA hunters from harassing the people. Like, hey, they're all scared here because of the disaster. We don't also want to make them scared of us too. They also find Hunter C-20, who's still kind of out of her mind repeating the phrase, it's real. They haven't completely answered what that is that she's referring to, but she also reveals that she told Lady Loki the secret of how to find and locate the timekeepers. 
I think the twist with that is that the timekeepers themselves will be in a separate pocket dimension, like at the end of actual time. Loki asks for the files on the end of time and they won't give them to him. But the idea that they're in a separate pocket dimension separated from the rest of the timekeeper citadel in the TVA, like in a separate space that you can't just walk to. Then this whole last act of the episode is kind of like Loki versus Lady Loki with them trading barbs back and forth. Like he tries to make fun of her for using enchantment magic. Uh, it's kind of amateurish. That's also kind of an Easter egg for the Enchantress in Marvel Comics. Everyone's always wondering when she's going to show up. They did her sister, Lorelai, on the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show, but they never actually done legit Enchantress in the movies or on the TV shows before. Lady Loki also tries to call him out for working for the TVA, being one of their stooges. Then he tries to explain that he's really trying to play them on a long con, even though she doesn't believe him. Like, yeah, right, whatever. Then in rapid succession, she jumps through a bunch of different bodies and the male to female transitions here are just meant to be another reference to Loki in the comics and in real world Norse mythology, changing genders all the time. Loki tries to offer her a team up bargain that he's going to overthrow the timekeepers, even though she doesn't want to have anything to do with it. She continues to stall for time, like they're both back and forth, just speechifying, stalling for more time. He makes the funny joke about finally understanding how Thor feels, why he's so pissed off with him all the time. Now I understand how Thor feels. You won't shut up. When Lady Loki explains that she's not interested in overthrowing the timekeepers, I think that's because she wants to destroy the entire TVA itself and the sacred timeline, like completely get rid of everything. As evidence, when she uses the time bombs at the end of the episode to blow the sacred timeline into a thousand different branches. They have a funny Thor's hammer reference when Loki calls the Roomba to himself and beats her with it. Let he who is worthy wield the powers of Roomba. Then she finally reveals her true form, stepping out, unfurling her hood, and you see her horns. Her character is actually an amalgam of Lady Loki and the Icole character from the comics, two completely different characters, but just playing the idea that both of those characters gender swapped quite a bit. Lady Loki came from this big siege event that Marvel had, and it was sort of the original version of Loki taking over Sif's body, or a body that was meant for Sif, until eventually he took his male Loki form again, then died again and was sort of reborn into the Icole version of Loki. And all those different identity changes where he was taking different forms, male and female, happened after or during big apocalyptic events, like you're seeing during the episode here. So just a big callback to their origin stories during the episode. Then when she says, this isn't about you, just as the bombs are all going off, obviously it's a reference to her not really caring what happens to him. Like she's here to try and take out the complete time variance authority and the timekeepers themselves, the sacred timeline. She doesn't care what happens to the alternate variant Lokis. But it's also a metaphor about positioning herself as the superior version of Loki and in a funny meta way saying, no, the show isn't about you. It's really about me because her ego is just as big as our version of Loki's ego. But as all the bombs start going off and they start registering the fracturing sacred timeline in the Time Variance Authority, you go to Ravona Renslayer's monitor and they actually show you where a lot of these events are happening and a lot of them are big Easter eggs from the Marvel movies. There's Vietnam in 1522, Portugal in 1492, there's Vormir in the year 2301, that's another Soul Stone reference or a Red Skull reference. Black Widow died on Vormir in 2014, so I don't think it's meant to be a Black Widow reference. Thornton, USA in 1551, Cookville in 1999, Asgard in 2004, that would have actually been just before the events of the first Thor movie, Rome in 1390, Sakaar in 1984, 1984 was the year Incredible Hulk number 300 was released and it was this huge giant size issue with black costume Spider-Man teaming up with Doctor Strange trying to stop Hulk from destroying New York City after he had become the Savage Hulk. There's Barachara, Colombia in 1808, Porvu, Finland in 1708. There's one on Ego the Living Planet in the year 1382. There's one on Thanos' homeworld of Titan in 1982. Thanos did have a small backup role in the 1982 storyline, The Death of Captain Marvel. There's one in New York City in 1947. That's actually the year a massive smallpox outbreak happened, not too dissimilar from what happened to us in 2020 with the virus. There's Tokyo in 1984. There was a big earthquake that happened in Japan that year. There's Hala in the year 51, which is the Cree homeworld near the turn of the millennia. Kingsport 1999, Xandar in 1001, that's the homeworld of the Nova Corps. 2005 in Beijing, Madrid in 1903. Then the list keeps going on and on and on, but they cut to Ravona Renslayer's face for the reaction. She's just completely horrified by everything, grabbing her sun baton and running out. You also see on her helmet that when she was a hunter, her designation was A23. 
Then as you rush out to the hallway, you see all those portals opening. This is the point of departure, like the train station, the depot, so to speak, where all the hunters go on their missions from. So they're going to all these different places to try and close them down. Like there's one in Portland that they rush to. There's one on Ego, the living planet that they rush to. One of the reasons why I think that Lady Loki is doing this is not only to create all these branch timelines, but also the idea that you have all these hunters, every single person that they have, trying to go to all these different realities to close down the branch timelines, leaving the TVA unprotected so that she can then break in and get to the timekeepers. She picks up the time pad device from one of the bombs and then opens a portal escaping, Loki chasing after her just as Mobius comes running along to stop him. And then they actually make some changes to the end credit scenes that you probably notice. There's a clearly visible file on Lady Loki amongst all the other files on our version of Loki, including the D.B. Cooper event. You see Sophia DiMartino's name appear in the credits right after this. She's the actress who's playing Lady Loki. There's also different theme music on the credits too, which sounds totally badass. They did the same thing during Falcon and Winter Soldier where they changed the end credits just a little bit as new characters were revealed. They also do another close-up on Loki's file at the very end of the credits, reminding you about his gender designation as fluid because of all the different versions of Loki that we saw during the episode and the idea that female Loki was body swapping male to female a couple different times. Also, this device here that you see in the credits is not a sling ring from the Doctor Strange movie. It's actually one of their little devices they use to rewind time for individuals that you saw during episode one. But everybody let me know in the comments what your favorite moment from the episode was. I will do an episode three trailer video next but if you spotted any big Easter eggs in the episode that I didn't talk about during the video, just write them below in the comments. I have a couple other big Loki Easter egg and bonus videos planned for this week too, so if you have any special requests, just leave them in the comments below, and I'll name a giveaway winner in my Loki trailer video that I post next. But everyone, click here for all my Loki episode videos, and click here to learn why the Infinity Stones don't work on Loki anymore. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys tonight.